This episode of the Everything Matters podcast is brought to you by BeLegendary.coach, where we transform leaders into legends. Are you a senior leader, entrepreneur, or executive looking to take your leadership to the next level? Are you dealing with things such as imposter syndrome, concerns with whether or not your leadership is lingering long after you've completed phase time, looking for new and innovative ways to connect with your team and to gain buy-in from stakeholders that you deal with on a daily basis? If any of this sounds like something that you're dealing with and you would like to take your leadership to an extraordinary level, your effectiveness to a legendary level, visit BeLegendary.coach. That's www.BeLegendary.coach and schedule your free performance analysis today. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the first episode of 2023 of the Everything Matters podcast. My name is Bradford Speaks. I'm your host, also founder and CEO of BeLegendary.coach, a performance coaching and leadership development company where we transform leaders into legends. Now, many of you start off the new year with your brand new resolutions, and a lot of you have ideas about opening up a business. In fact, you had this idea last year. In fact, you had it in 2021, maybe even in 2020, and the pandemic got you knocked off track. Either way it goes, bring that dream to this episode. If you've been thinking about starting a business and you maybe don't know where to get the funds from, how to put together the strategy, how to put together a leadership team, Gusher does all of that for you. They use a concept called performance-based equity, which essentially means if you don't win, they don't win. My special guest today on this episode of the Everything Matters podcast, his name is Chris Joyce. Chris owns a company called Gusher. And what Gusher does is Gusher helps you put all those pieces into place. So if you have a product or a service that you want to bring to market this year or maybe next year, and you're just not quite sure about how to get that facilitated, Chris and his team at Gusher can help you get that done. Chris is the founder of 24 companies that have served in multiple industries, including high tech, consumer goods, health and manufacturing. His products have been sold in more than 11,000 stores in more than 23 countries. So he's what I would consider an expert in what he's doing. One of the things that Chris shared with me that really stood out and showed me who he was and what he stood for is the fact that he said he believes that talent is one of the things that spread evenly. Opportunities are not. So he aims to make sure that anyone who has a great idea has the opportunity to get it to market. So please join me in welcoming my very special guest today, my friend, Chris Joyce, to the Everything Matters podcast. Chris, let's get it popping, my man. Chris, welcome to the Everything Matters podcast, my man. I appreciate you so much for coming on to the show and for sharing everything that you're up to, man, and all the things that you're doing that are, I, I found are really, really fascinating to help small businesses grow and scale. So again, thank you for joining the Everything Matters podcast today. Oh, thanks for having me, Bradford. I, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Awesome, man. Awesome. So Chris, I like to start out typically just giving people a sense of who you are. Now, I've never seen you on you know, CNN or Fox, not saying you haven't been there. But, you know, at the at this podcast, we like to highlight people who are doing big things. Sure. And, and they're kind of under the radar. So I'm so happy to have you here. So tell tell the audience who you are, you know, what you're about, what you do. And and I'd also like to know personally, like, where are you from? I know you live in the Philly area right now, but you know, where'd you grow up, man? What was childhood like for you? Absolutely. Well, I'm not from a, from the Philly area. That's number one. If, okay. If you notice I pronounce water like it actually is supposed to be pronounced, <laughs> not water. I love it. Uh, but I, I grew up in, in, in Dayton, Ohio, Fairborn, Ohio, in the middle okay. of nowhere. I always say cornfields and factories. It's either one or the other. Uh, yeah. But I've always started my own businesses. I've had more than 24 companies. Uh, my, my consumer goods companies, I've had products sold in more than 11,000 stores in 23 countries. Uh, my tech products, my software companies, I've got users in more than 148 countries across the globe. And for lack of a better word, I, I, I'm really just a startup fanatic and I have started almost every type of business there is. And so wow. you know, my new platform, Gusher, we just help people go ahead and get going in startups. I love it, man. I love it. That's so much. I mean, there's so much. I think that, you know, um, when COVID happened, 
there are a lot of people. And I would sit around and go in restaurants and go in business. I'm like, where did everybody go? Like yeah. everybody's short staff. And what I what I learned was that a lot of people found ways to make money online because they were backwards were against the wall. And they're like, hey, man, I got to eat. I got to pay the bills. So what am I going to do? Right. The cl- stores closed down. I can't go back to work. Restaurants are closed. Yeah. So I would imagine that your business has been pretty busy. So, you know, I love to talk about, you know, um, you know, what have you seen like in your in your experience of being out there in that landscape? What have you seen uh, as far as the types of small businesses that that have really began to blossom over the last few years since since COVID particularly? Sure. Well, well, during COVID particularly, we grew over 400 percent in that period. So over the last year, year and a half in, before, actually, I should say that it was about a 400 percent growth rate, which was insane. Uh, the second that that COVID hit, uh, our system was just off the off the charts in wow. terms of what we did. You know, the businesses that we've seen have actually been spread pretty evenly, uh, wow. meaning that you see everything from SaaS companies, software as a service. Uh, you see fintech companies. You see uh, low tech uh, pet food companies. Mm-hmm. Uh, you see electronics uh, design firms. And I mean, these are companies that are always started by one person, maybe two per- people with absolutely nothing. So wow. everything from manufacturing, SaaS, fintech, AR. VR, AI, gaming, medical devices, prop tech, you name it, they're starting it. And and right now, entrepreneurship is on really the cusp of exploding and having another revolution. Yeah, I totally agree. And I, and I think that, you know, big, big, large corporations uh, are are trembling because one of the things that I'm disappointed about, I go into the store and I buy Snickers and the same, same Snickers bar, same, it's actually smaller than it was when I was little. I promise it's smaller. And you probably know the same thing I'm I talking about. Snickers. Yeah, I know. And it's two bucks, man. Yeah. You know, now if somebody can come in a smaller business, lower overhead, right? Lower cost yep. to produce that product, maybe give you a larger size, a good quality, quality ingredients at a cheaper price, man. Uh, Mars and Snickers are not going to be able to compete with that. So I love the fact that entrepreneurship is on the rise and I love highlighting small businesses there. I think they're the not not that I think it's fact that they're the lifeblood of our economy. Oh, oh, most definitely. Uh, in terms of, of new job growth, the fact of the matter is startups and very small businesses account for the vast majority uh, of new job growth. Now, yeah. big firms have the majority of jobs in place, but that's because sure. they've been around forever. But almost exactly. all innovation, all new jobs are from very small businesses starting out from scratch uh, that add those two, three, four, five, ten, twenty 10, uh, people in those first year or two. That's right. where the job growth comes. But you touched on something really cool there when you were talking about, you know, let's the candy bar. And, and that's a great example because what we've seen is with entrepreneurship, the ability to have these very narrow micro markets, almost in a way, yeah. the, these subsets of markets that almost in a way the big boys don't go after because it doesn't move the needle on their balance sheet at all. Yet there's these huge opportunities where you're able to go direct to consumer in these very small markets, mm-hmm. what I call zealot markets, that mm-hmm. you create a product, you create an idea something around a very specific zealot, and you're able to get those first hundred customers, which leads to the first thousand customers, which may not lead to a millions upon millions of customers, but you can have a pretty substantial business upon a couple thousand or 10,000 customers. Love it, man. Yeah. And that can be a pretty, pretty uh, stable income and stable living for someone to, to have for themselves. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, many, and many times it actually results in companies that you can resell and go on to something else right. if that's what you're interested in. Very true. Very true. I love it. So, one question I have personally is, OK, say say you have an you have an idea. Say I have a an idea for a business. Right. Sure. What would be like the or if I set up a consultation with you for an hour and, and, you know, Chris, man, here's my idea. Here's what I want to do. What would be some of the and I know it's going to vary depending on what type of business it is. But yeah. what are some of the first key steps that you would advise that new business owner to do? Like, is it is it getting the logo made? Is it the branding, the website? Like what, what direction would you point? None of that. None, None of that. that. Now, now the, the first thing I'm going to say is this. First of all, you don't require a penny. We're, we're never going to ask you for a penny. Uh, we do get a percentage of your company if you okay. succeed. If okay. you don't succeed, we get absolutely nothing. But uh, in terms of starting up on Gusher and starting a business, the first thing really that you should think about it is not necessarily your design. Is not necessarily um, really even in a way the end product or, or the pricing or something like that. What you really want to think of, at least from our perspective, is are you able – and this is going to sound a little bit crazy, but are you able to recruit somebody into your company as part of your team for what's called performance-based equity? Now, what do I mean by that? This is going to make sense at the end. 
All right. So on Gusher, people join companies in exchange for performance-based equity. So what it does is it helps get your company off the ground. You can get like a million or two million of labor is the way of looking at it. But okay. people join your company to help get your company off the ground. OK, so the point is not to become as founder, an expert graphic designer. It's not to be an expert front end developer. It's not meant to be an expert chemist or materials engineer or whatever mm -hmm. it is. What you really should be doing is honing in on your core fundamental problem and how to communicate that to somebody. Because that communication of the problem, the being able to have somebody uh, relate to it, to find people and, and tell it in such a way so simple an eight-year-old can understand it, mm -hmm. where it's authentic, well, that is how businesses are born. Because you may have the best damn idea in the world. And we see this yeah. with venture capital funded companies. You have the best idea in the world. You start attacking it technically. But guess what? They forgot to talk to people. They right. forgot to, to, to get that quote unquote product market fit. Well, yeah. with us, we put that at the forefront. We, and the best way of knowing it is, is somebody willing to join you in your quest for building this company for a piece of the pie? And that separates it because anybody will join your company for money, even if they don't fundamentally believe in it. I mean, think about how many people work for a company today they fundamentally don't believe in or don't like or whatever yeah. it may be. They do it because yeah. it puts food on the table. Right. But who the heck is going to join your company in exchange for equity? I'll tell you, the people that believe in what you're doing so That's long right. as you hone that message correctly. And so we show people how to hone that message and get it done the right way. That's awesome, man. So so when you talk about what, gut, you know, someone comes to Gusher and they want to to do what you're talking about doing here. Sure. How long does that process take? I mean, like in, you know, um, you know, when you talk about, having like a shared equity. Are we yeah. talking about something like, you know, you guys will contract a designer over here, contract a product development person over here, like, and bring them all together and everybody gets a share of the company once it's scales to a certain point. Like, how does all that work? Okay. Well, in terms of timeframes, this is the way to view it. So I'm going to paint the best scenario we've ever seen on Gusher and okay. it's a one-off. Okay. So it's one out of hundreds of companies. Okay. So our fastest company that came together came together in literally a couple hours. And, and it was a high tech medical service type of company where a person had a concept, was able to get a team immediately interest and basically took off like a rocket. So getting that team, that first stage took a couple hours. Okay. But on average, usually it takes a founder anywhere between four to eight weeks to okay. be able to get that first team. So what do I mean by that first team? Well, if you're forming a company and I'm, you know, I'm not different industries will vary differently as to what they need, sure. but almost always you're going to need a chief marketing officer, a creative director. You're going to need a chief financial officer. You're going to need the people that build the product, like, um, uh, let's say copywriter. You're going to need front end, back end developers. You may need some materials engineer or industrial designer. If you're going in creating a physical product, right. uh, you may need a UI, UI, designer if you're creating a software product. Well, what happens is the following. Typically, when a founder is able to get one person, one person on for performance-based equity, then the rest follow. It, it becomes really like hot knife through warm butter. But it's getting that first person on that's usually the hardest and bringing them in. And once a founder sees that, hey, it can be done, uh, it's literally just a piece of cake from there. And that's the hardest part of starting a startup. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd imagine putting that team together and getting the right folks in place who actually have the expertise and the knowledge of how to how to take a product to market or a service to market or whatever you're doing and actually make it scale. But so I'm, I'm curious. So how are this team that's 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 put together while they're working on this project and getting it to wherever it needs to be? Right. And putting in their time and sweat equity, if you will, into exactly. getting it to where it needs to go. How are they compensated, you know, before it reaches that point? Because I know they get you know, equity based performance based equity. Right. How does that equate to them in terms of dollars? Today. Sure. Well, well, think of this. You the teams and the way they're put together is meant to accomplish the launch. So whatever the okay. launch is. So it may be just getting that first iteration out. It may be going ahead and bring it to market and getting sales. But the whole point is that this is considered founder stock. So the people that are coming together, they're they're the primary core group of founders. Now, are they working on it full time? Chances are not. Is it something that usually these people have excess capacity, meaning they have extra hours, extra time? 
Absolutely. But usually what it means is these, the people that join the company are really, they're top at what they do. So they come in and they bring a laser-like focus and a laser-like value to the creation of your company. So let's use a CMO, for instance. The average CMO that comes into a, a gusher company, per se, like, like a consumer goods company, mm -hmm. is usually a female, uh, usually between the ages of 40, 45 years old, uh, usually has a very book, big book of business and has done a similar company before. So for them, almost in a way, I don't want to say it's cookie cutter, sure. but almost in a way they've templatized what they're doing and they're able to bring that expertise in very, very quickly. Nice. That's really awesome, man. Really great. So um, tell us about, you know, like how did you get into like what's your let's back up a little bit, go over sort of your background, like your education, your experience, expertise and how you actually fell into buying, you know, buying businesses, starting businesses, selling yeah. businesses and everything that you do is around business. How did that all begin for you? Did this come up really young or how, how, how did it come about? OK, I'm going to say it over 60 seconds, but I'll cover it fast. All right, because there's right. too too much, way too much. All right. All right. OK, got it. so I'm going to go really, really quick here. You ready? Mm -hmm. All right. First business I started when I was six years old selling burpee seeds door to door as a result of seeing a biz op ad in the back of a comic book. OK, yeah. I went ahead and ended up going to NYU, uh, studied business and finance and everything else there. But the second day that I was at NYU, I joined a big Wall Street firm, became the youngest stockbroker ever at the age of 17, 18 uh, and was off to the races. I hated selling stock. I mm. went ahead and, and threw some money into a tech business at the time when I was around 1920. Uh, we spent literally, I think it was a couple hundred bucks on uh, flyers. And the next month we had over $50,000 in revenue. And from then on out, yeah. it was business after business after business. I always, always tried to do new businesses. I didn't like to do the same business twice. And I never mm. liked to do a business the way that somebody else did. And so that eventually led to basically the creation of Gusher and helping people out in that scenario where they didn't have anything to get going. Unbelievable, man. I, I, you're like one of those phenoms starting a business before you're even 10 years old. So it's really incredible story, man. Really incredible story. So what is it that that drives you, Chris? Like, you know, what is it that and particularly around startups, like what is it about startups and entrepreneurs that really just lights you up and inspires you? This is the thing, and it's going to be a roundabout answer, okay? So okay. When growing up in Ohio, I saw my mom working quite literally a, a low-level secretary job as a GS-5 at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and she always had these brilliant ideas. Now, she was never able to get them off the ground. She was never able to really get them going at all until well into her 50s when she, quote-unquote, finally made it, all right? Mm. And so I saw that that had a huge impact upon me in, in terms of how I create businesses and what I look for in founders and, and what I'm looking to do. Mm -hmm. But the older that I've gotten, the more gray hair that I've gotten, the more kids that I've gotten, right. it really comes down to that. I see a lot of people and what gets me off is that untapping that human potential on a massive scale. Well, mm -hmm. that has ripple effects. That That's a damn good thing. Just to do with your life. I want to say it's it's a noble endeavor. And so in a way, that's what I like doing. It's not the fact that, hey, we're creating a new company and separated from the human element. It's, hey, I helped Greg in Chicago, Illinois, that had funding of $10 million uh, from a private equity firm. He got kicked out of his company, uh, was left almost penniless, taking care of his special needs brother. And sure enough, he gushered a deal. And right now he's off to the races. Or hell, heck, I helped uh, Kitty in South Africa an 80-year-old grandmother uh, that literally was able to get a, a product off the ground, do a QVC deal uh, with a team that looks like the UN. Or, hey, I helped Colin, you know, who had a sick dog, created a dog food out of uh, nowhere, the most capital-intensive business there is. Mm. And suddenly, he's just got a deal for 500 CVSs and growing like a rocket. You know, it's helping the people and getting involved with them. And that, that's kind of just a damn, damn cool thing. Yeah. It's untapping that human potential. I love it, man. And being a coach, you know, that's exactly yeah. we're totally aligned. I love to see people just something light up about them. And they, 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 they say, you know what? I got this business idea, Bradford, and I want to do it. I'm like, well, call Chris, man. He's got you. <laughs> yeah. You know what I like? I like when they go through, uh, they go through the pain, they mm -hmm. go through the furnace. All right. And they come out the other side and they're not ash. They've turned into and evolved into someone else. The person right. they were, they were supposed to be or meant to be. That's a cool thing to see. Really is really is, man. That's awesome. 
And, and what inspires me is to hear that you love the evolution that happens with people and them being able to be, you know, just just really turned on about what they're doing and see that whatever they thought was there stopping them wasn't really there. It was just an illusion. You could do it. hundred percent. It's your mind to it. Exactly. exactly. So I want to give. I want to give people an opportunity to hear about, you know, what about some of the fire that you went through and you didn't come out as ashes, what things that you go through, what challenges and failures have you had to face that you came out? You're like, man, I didn't know I could make it through this. And wow. Look at what I've done. Tell us about that. Well, one of the first times was, and, and then I'll cover a very big one. One of the first times was really when I was nine years old and I came up with a, what I thought was a great idea uh, for a new type of car brake. And my stepfather was, well, let's just say he was an a-hole. That would be a nice way of putting it. But he was an electrical engineer by training and he proceeded to, to crap on my idea so much worse than anyone for the next 30 years or 40 years crapped on an idea. And, and literally, you know, I was kind of shattered, but I remember that, that even then I was like, no, I, you know, F you basically, uh, in terms of my head, I'm like, F you, I fundamentally think I'm right. So, you know, that hardened that little thing right there, even as a kid hardened me growing up, you know, the thing that says that, you know, growing up in an effed up family uh, makes you quite possibly uh, be the most qualified person in the world uh, to be able to start a business because the BS that you deal with in a family is is almost way more uh, than you deal with on the business side. And if you can deal with an effed up wow. family and come through that, uh, you can definitely start a successful business. I heard that, man. I heard that. Yeah, but uh, on the large scale side, I, I've had it where I had a very, very large business uh, that was everywhere. I mean, it was everywhere uh, one day. And, and sure enough, we were the lightning rod for the industry. Uh, we were growing very, very rapidly. And then the whole market imploded. Uh, it went from 16% of the population uh, consuming this type of product to less than 1%. Uh, we had deals with everybody. And I remember uh, literally sitting in, I had three factories at the time, uh, sitting in these big ass factories in this one factory. And it was just like quiet. I mean, it, there was nobody there because we went from this full time 20, right, 24 hours, uh, three, three uh, shifts a week, seven day a right. week production uh, to absolutely nothing. I mean, nothing. And I literally, and I, I mean this 100% truthfully, at the end, which that business really was, towards the very, very end, they had to literally kiff, kiff, pick me up and carry me out of the business because <laughs> I refused to leave. I mean, I was like, right. that's how far you push it, or I pushed it. Yeah. Um, and that was a painful experience. It took me basically five years to get back to zero, that, to wow. get back to zero. Wow. So that was ugly. I mean, I, yeah, that's, that's really ugly. And one thing I can hear in everything you're sharing here is that you have a certain tenacity. And so I want to give your stepdad a shout out for doing whatever he did that gave you that tenacity to stick to, hey, you know what? Stick to your guns because yeah. you probably wouldn't be where you were right now if it had, if you hadn't developed that about yourself, right? Absolutely. So, and, and like I think it back, oh, sh I could have had a better childhood or whatever. I'm like, no, I had the right childhood for me. That, that, that was right for me and my story and my ending. That's right. Awesome, man. You know, as you talk about, <clears throat> you mentioned a couple of times that, you work with like products and stuff like that, like, you know, consumer products. So I want to ask a question for anyone out there that might be curious of what the process is like. Let's say I make a, a I got a great sauce that I make at home. Right. And it's just, it's got this, the most amazing recipe. I'm from Louisiana. So I love popping flavor in my mouth yeah. and I create this sauce and I come to Gusher and I say, Chris, man, I want to get this into Walmart. I want to get into Target. I want to get into Kroger. I want to get into all the grocery stores around the country. How does that work? That's always been something that I've been okay. curious about. You see those small brands that are now, how oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. How, did, how did grandpa, grandpa get well, mustard in here? <laughs> they don't necessarily, they, they may look small, but that may be purposeful. Okay. So hear mm -hmm. me out. So Got the it. product that you create in your kitchen and a commercially viable product, a commercially scaled product are fundamentally two different things. The, okay. the product in your kitchen can be the starting point for that actual scalable product. Kind of like that, that dog food company I was telling you about. He went ahead and created a dog food. He created it in his kitchen. He hacked it for three, four, five months because he had a sick dog. But now taking that product and turning it into something that can be in CVS, Walgreens, uh, Target, that's something right. a little bit different. So let me tell you the process in a nutshell. Yeah. The Great. first thing that you need is you need a product formulator. 
Why? Okay. This is typically a chemist. Food chemist is a common phrase, whatever it may be. Because when you deal with stuff that's ingested and you start scaling it for, for, for distribution on a larger scale or in a commercial environment, there's little things there that you may not be aware that can quite literally kill people. And so there is a process of food production uh, that's ingestible that really needs to be followed. Uh, and so you need to bring that person in, that food chemist, that formulator from the very beginning part of it. So what they'll do is they'll take your, 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 uh, your formulation, or I should say your recipe, whatever it may be, and they'll duplicate it, but duplicate it for scaling which may just be a little bit different, all right? Or it may be a different cooking process. It may be a different packaging process, okay? Gotcha. So that's the first step. Uh, the second thing that you need to do is right from the very beginning, think about marketing. So what I tell everybody that creates a product, whether it's you know a consumer goods product or a very high technical product, is that no matter what business you think you're in, you are a marketing company. So even if you're manufacturing this product or you're manufacturing some electronic chip, you're in, you're a marketing company. So one of the core people you need to bring in from the very beginning is a chief marketing officer or a chief creative director, somebody that can identify the personas, the people, the types of people, the markets right. that make sense for the low hanging fruit to penetrate and sell to initially what we call your zealot markets to be able to generate revenue. So what they do is they identify those markets and they give it a creative voice. So you may have a creative voice as you, as in terms of as a start or how you see it, right. but they're going to figure out those correct words, the correct phrases, the correct look for it. And so, you know, design, yeah, design is, is definitely, you need something, but that's, believe it or not, a lower level position, a lower level priority, because you can always go ahead and iterate that. But yeah. also you need packaging designer. Uh, you need somebody to be able to tell you that based upon the competition that's out there, shelf space is a battle, okay? It's a war. So there are yeah, certain things, time. certain restrictions, certain conditions, certain ways of doing it that will enable you to penetrate and get shelf space better. But it goes even one further. So because shipping is so damn important and a very big cost, it could be 30% of your cost of your product uh, in shipping, wow. that literally that package container, how are you cooking in the container, the weight of the container, the dimensional weight, uh, the production lead times, is it two months, is it four months, is it six months? All these things impact how that company and product comes together, but more importantly, how your cash flow is going to be impacted. Now, not to go into too much, but this is the way your comp a company typically does it. They create a first generation product. Then that generation product is recreated and recreated. So when I had a low carb manufacturing company, we went through six generations of product in the course of two years, getting up to 50 million. And that's really the process on a rapid, rapid phase. So you need CMO, you need CTO, you need CFO, you need product designer, uh, you need formulator. Uh, and depending upon websites and all that, you need those types of people, too. Wow. And all that happens before you even go try to pitch it to Walmart. You got to have all this stuff in place. Well, yeah. Or you can do the following, which we also teach to founders. You, you don't actually create the product. So what you do is you create a one page sheet that explains what you're doing. You send it to the buyers and you see what comes back. We, we've actually made medical devices after we've gotten orders that didn't exist before. Yep. Uh, wow. Literally, I see your look on your face right now. Like, you got to be kidding me. No, nope. That's crazy. We've, we've gotten in Walmart. We've gotten in Target. We've gotten in Publix. All these different things without having the product ahead of time. Wow. Man, that's incredible. Uh, that's incredible. So, one thing also that you said I want to that I want to touch on is that, you know, I mean, this this type of consultative uh, service, if you will, that you're that you're offering with Gusher. And I get that you're doing the equity performance based equity piece. I mean, can cost can cost tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars, sure. hundreds of thousands of dollars to have someone come in and, get, and offer that kind of expertise. And one thing you said was that you help people do this for nothing. Right. Well, not you for nothing. Need, or, or, or you need very little. Yeah, yeah. Right. By that, we don't charge people up front because it's a time or even at all. In, if we're dealing with somebody in South Africa or we're dealing with college students at Villanova uh, or we're dealing with, you know, a guy that just got laid off of COVID-19, which, by the way, one product of the year uh, last year. Uh, wow. These are the types of things that it's not about a walletectomy up front. Now, do we ask for money in the future? Believe it or not, no. 
uh, but we are an equity player also. So the only way that we succeed is if you succeed. We don't ask for anything. Uh, we're not sitting there asking for money. You're not. No money is actually required to do any of the things I'm telling you about. All, All right. it is 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 hard work and following the process. Unbelievable, really unbelievable. I mean, I don't know why anyone wouldn't go to Gusher right now and 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 sign up and get their stuff looked at. So I'm curious about the name, Gusher. Sure. Where'd that come from? <laughs> Here's where it came from. There, there was a movie a very long time ago uh, that <laughs> nobody has watched. It, it was Giant by James Dean. And there's a scene in the movie where he's a wildcatter. He's a guy with absolutely nothing. Zippo, not a to mm. his name. And he goes ahead and wildcats, which means he's drilling for oil in the middle of Texas, just kind of randomly. He doesn't know whether it's there or not. And suddenly he goes from being an absolute pauper uh, with a broken down truck stuck in the middle of this farm field to basically hitting a gusher and he hit a gusher uh, so much that that oil uh, went ahead and came out of that well so powerfully and so profusely uh, that that was the start uh, of an empire and so uh, when we say gusher in a way you know that's what we're thinking and that's really what basically our reason for, for doing it but also it makes a good verb you gusher a deal you gusher this you gusher that yeah i love it man you know what i'm thinking about as you talk through that one of my favorite shows watching as a kid i'm telling my age here the Beverly Hillbillies, man. They hit a gush. Bubbling crude. Moved out to L.A., baby. <laughs> Living the big life. Exactly. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, Chris, I, you, you mentioned earlier also that your mom was a, uh, you know, inspires you when you were younger and, and watching her Definitely. and what she did. Uh, who else do you look at as someone who really is like, you know, I shouldn't say idolize. I don't care if that works so much. But someone you look up to and you say, man, this person really inspired me. That really touched you. And, and, um. And gave you the vision to do what you're doing. Who would that be? Yeah, there were. Listen, I, I come from like like negative reinforcement, so I, I wish I had these mentors and these people there that that yeah. you know helped me along the way and told me what to do. I had the reverse. I had people that were just not supportive all, at all, or I just had yeah. people that were they were never there. So almost in a way, yeah. yeah, it was internal drive. I remember my heroes as a kid. You know, were weightlifters and bodybuilders and everything else. Looking up to them, uh, but really there was one person uh, called Sir James Goldsmith and nobody remembers him. Uh, he was a guy uh, that was uh, actually dual citizenship, British and French and everything else. But he ended up being a takeover guy in the 80s. And he took over Elf Aquitaine, which was a big oil company and a couple others. But the reason why he was my hero was he was an eloquent defender of free markets. He laid it out very precisely why the free market system uh, works and works for most people and, and the vast majority of people, even though they might not be aware of it. And so that kind of inspired me. And I found him very, very inspiring as a kid growing up. Outstanding, Chris. You know, I want to say that, you know, the stuff that we've been talking about off camera, I want to do another podcast with you so we can have a, a, a you know, some real serious conversation. Awesome, man. So, you know, one of the things that's really important to me, Chris, is, is you know, and I really worked hard to instill this in my kids is how you lead the world after you're gone. Right. So, how do you impact the world as you impact our youth and you impact leadership, which is why I do leadership coaching and development. Yeah. So when it comes to young people and, and, and I was telling you earlier that, you know, I'm seeing a lot of younger people that are not wanting to go the traditional college route. And I, I can imagine for a few different reasons. One, they don't want to be a hundred thousand dollars in debt in the next four years. Right. Easily. And, 100. And yeah. Not making enough money to be able to even pay the, 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 the student loan bill. So that's one reason. And there's others. So how do you see Gusher and what role do you see Gusher playing in, helping these young people get their ideas out in the world. And what difference do you want to make when it comes to that? Sure. Well, I, there's a couple of things. I, I want to talk about that real quickly. So, you know, university, college, whatever it may be, is not necessarily – for everyone. You know, there are certain paths that you have to have just only only because of requisites, whether it's law school, uh, whether it's becoming a doctor and you have to pass the boards, etc. You know, there are things that definitely make sense to do that. But a lot of times, you know, people are just wired differently and it just doesn't necessarily make sense. I know you can make a hell of a lot of money right now being a welder. So going to trade school and just being a welder and doing that, well, let me tell you something. Those jobs are in high, high demand. Uh, and so, there's many ways to make money, uh, but when it comes to you know college and making that decision, 
A, it's a very personal decision. I don't think it's for everybody, even close to everybody. And necessarily what they're teaching you in college isn't relevant to, let's say, running your own deal or running your own business. I have a self-vested interest in saying that. I acknowledge it. Uh, but for youth today, in terms of like what we bring in, in terms of Gusher, we simply provide a way to start a business to test out your idea risk-free and you don't need anything. That's it yeah. in a nutshell. So you have an idea for a business. You need the expertise of others to bring it to life. Well, instead of either having to bootstrap or save your money or you do it yourself and it taking years to happen, you now have experts at your fingertips that can go ahead and join it. So, you know, we have college students. We have college dropouts. We have mm. people that are PhDs uh, and everything in between. So, yeah. you know, the one thing that I've seen is that education isn't necessarily an indicator of you going to go ahead and be success. With startups and entrepreneurship, I am going to say this, and it's going to come across as maybe some message I don't know if I should put out there, but that I've seen more founders that succeed that don't have a college education or have a mm. partial college education because almost in a way they're, they're too creative for that environment and it doesn't yeah. fit. And so with business being creative is a damn good thing, especially at the initial stages. I totally agree. You know, you, 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 you picked my brain right there because I was exactly thinking as you were speaking, I'm thinking creativity, uh, school, you know, uh, compulsory education does tend to stifle uh, creativity. You know, I know when, when I was a kid and you and I are probably around the same age, you know, yeah. when, when I was younger, we had shop in school, we had home economics, right? We had these other creative things and those, all those things have been castrated. They're all gone, yeah. you know? And, and I think that that's contributed directly to the, the, um, our position, our loss in position, I should say, as a country, as being a major producer of goods and services, you know, in addition to things being shipped offshore, you know. Yeah, but but also listen to this. I, I've got a 14-year-old son who's been doing it since he was 13. He goes mm -hmm. ahead. He buys shoes, I guess, whatever the hot shoes are, whatever he's able to get the deal. Right. And he flips right. them. So he makes on average anywhere between $50 to $400 a shoe. And he comes and goes. And, you know, he's netting anywhere from $4,000 to $10,000 a year just selling shoes. Selling I've shoes. got an 11-year-old uh, that does almost the same thing with candles. I've got a nine-year-old and I've never taught them. I've never, you know, hey, you got to do business or something. I've never dragged them up the hill. I've got yeah. a nine-year-old. He just turned nine. That he's like, hey, dad, you know, I want to do a business. I need to buy a phone. And I'm like, well, let's talk about it. And we went through Amazon last night and he's buying these pop-ups uh, for 20 cents that he's going to sell for a dollar or three for two dollars or whatever the hell it is. And that's yeah. his business, you know? So they, kids today, I think have a, a very, a, a, a bigger sense of entrepreneurship. Uh, they have it easier from that. They're not creating everything from scratch. If they want to do a linear business where they're just taking something else in bulk and reselling it, man, you can do that all day till the cows come home and still make money. Maybe you don't make millions, true. but you can at least pay the bills and, and not worry about eating. Very true. Yeah, you're right. And my kids and I talk about it too. They have access to the technology that they have. Uh, available to them makes it really easy. My son used to flip shoes too, ironically. Yeah. Um, but you know what I what I love about what you're doing is that with Gusher, you're creating a place and a platform for those who do want to create something from scratch. Exactly. Who do want to just create? They're just they're just by nature creators. They yep. want to have something different that has their signature on it in the world. So they have an avenue to do that with you. And I think that you know, man, I think what you're doing is really important because it does also create a space for us to 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 become producers again. Yes. Manufacturers. Right. I mean, manufacturing Absolutely. is completely gutted, man, here. So the more manufacturing we give, we raise the GDP. I mean, and, and it's just, you know, there's a it's good for all of the, all of America and even for the world. because we're and doing people, good. people may not realize this. People may think setting up manufacturing is complex and capital intensive and everything else. I think the other route, there are ways to go ahead and enter manufacturing very, very low cost or no cost. And what people don't realize is when you're the manufacturer, you control production. So you're able to take risk and be your own bank that you can't do if you're contracting the manufacturing out. And I think that that people don't realize that many times. So we take many companies and try to almost in a way push them into manufacturing. And then the light bulb goes off and they're like, oh, my God, I never realized that. And like, then they go. <laughs> I love it, man. So awesome, Chris. So awesome. So, Chris. Is there anything else that you want to share? You know, I, I definitely want to make sure that people know how to find you if they want to set up a consultation, maybe look at a partnership. Yeah, sure. I'm certainly going to look and see, you know, what's maybe there for me to help scale my coaching business. Who knows? You know, so yeah. um, so 
how can people find you for one? Is there anything else that you want to share that maybe we didn't cover in the interview so far? Sure. Uh, of course. Well, first of all, they can always find me, Fun Company, at gusher.co. It's not com. Gusher.co, the private equity firm that owns .com wouldn't sell it to us. So uh, gusher.co is where they want to go, all right? Um, in, in terms of the one thing, and this is what I, I, I say to really almost every audience that I speak to, okay? Th- there's really a couple things to remember. One, deal rule 28, trust the process. Once you start on this road, there's on the, the roller coaster of awesomeness, what I call entrepreneurship, there's only one person that can stop that ride. It, it, it's not your, your business partner. It's not your family. It's not your friends. It's not the, the economy. There's only one person that can stop that ride, and that's you, okay? So long as you never give up, and it's a very simple thing, but it's also a lot goes with it. As long as you never give up, you will arrive at the destination you're trying to reach. So just never give up. Man, brilliant, powerful. I love it. I think about Dory. Just keep swimming. Absolutely. Just keep swimming, man. Just keep swimming. Even better. Right? I love it. Chris, man, such a pleasure to have you on the podcast today, man. It's such valuable information uh, for helping business owners and people who have ideas to bring those things to market, man. And and I'm really excited about the work that you're doing and any way that I can support you and what, what you're doing with Gusher, please reach out, man. I'd love to love to have you back at some time to talk and update us on what's happening and some of the success stories that you that you can share with us as well. Great. Definitely. And thank you for having me. I'd be happy to help you in any way I can. And, and same thing with your listeners. Awesome, man. Take care, Chris. Good to see you, brother. See you. Bye bye. This is Doris Brown's baby boy. We out. <laughs>